Welcome into the Financial Freedom Roundtable, where each week we break down complex financial topics so you can more easily understand them, and more importantly, take action on your path to becoming financially free. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Grateful to have you in the room. I'm Russ Morgan. They call me the idea guy, mostly because bad internet guy didn't sound so cool to me. But enough about me for a moment. Let me introduce you to my co-host, my partner. He's the Italian stallion. He's got the license plate cover to prove it, Mr. Joe Murray. Stallion, good afternoon. Good afternoon, my friend. Always a pleasure to be with you. Debt. What is it good for anyway? That's the topic we're we're covering today. Why do you think that this is so important for us to touch on in the pursuit of financial freedom? And I'll tell you, I hear that four letter word and I think it is either the number one hurdle in your life to financial freedom or the possible accelerator to financial freedom. You get to choose that and it's all about your mindset on it. Mm. Well, we are gonna be covering mindset. That's gonna be point number one in today's topic. So I like where you lead in there. Okay. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring in a couple of our other financial coaches because we're surrounded by the dream team. To my left, I got a true financial Sherlock Holmes of our day. No problem too difficult to solve. If I'd only known him earlier, I'd be so much richer, said everybody. Mr. Downtown Ernie Brown. I see Ern. is going to be seen, Russ. Thank you. Tell me what's so important about this topic that we need to cover today. Well, I was thinking that I haven't met anyone who likes busy work. We all hate busy work. But the thing is, we also tend to do the thing or want to do the thing that's most commonly praised. And it's my observation, I wonder if you've encountered this, that in conversations with people, the thing that's praised in the financial world is those who are debt-free or have become debt-free, businesses that are debt-free, or uh, someone who goes to a church that is debt-free. That's that's like the, the gold standard, the thing to be praised. But unfortunately, the people who have done that spending the time to get to that situation may have just been doing busy work all along the while. And so I think this conversation, not that we're out there to change people's minds who aren't open to be changed, but at least to to put put some insight to the other side of the equation. I love that. So good. Well, let me get to your right, the retiree of the groups in the house. Mr. Catch me if you can. He's not killing bears with his bare hands or spirit diving for tuna. He's right here dropping gold nuggets, the one and only Mark Haraguchi. Welcome, Mark. It's been a while. It's been a while. It's, not, it's, it's nice to be back on this. I, I have been traveling a bit. Um, but this is probably a, a good one to hop back in on. I, I just saw an article yesterday as we were talking about this. Did you know that household debt reached $17.06 trillion dollars? in Q2 of 2023. Now, for for those of you that are listening in the future, I just want to remind you that this this is Q3 of 2023. So uh, last quarter, U.S. households, $17.06 trillion in debt. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of zeros. How do you think that impacts the way people think about money if they are dealing with, obviously, a fraction of that number, but they're dealing with the debt? And I mean, you said trillion. That's a number that's so big that we can't even understand our government deals in trillions on the you know yearly basis. <laughs> but for us, like that's a big number. How does someone who's dealing with their own level of debt, which for some of them seems like a mountain that they can't overcome, how big of a hurdle you think that is, Mark, for them becoming financially free? I think it can be very huge. It can be very huge because I I, I see that it can be debilitating. It starts to consume your thoughts. It's a weight that's sitting on you and it's it's impeding other thoughts from happening because you're so focused on that pressure that's happening to you. And so in terms of getting people towards financial freedom, we are going to talk about mindset. We've got to start reshaping how we think about things and we need to look past certain things so that we can get to that that finish line that we want to get to. Well, we're going to get into these topics through today's podcast. So if you're interested in How do you get over debt or how do you use debt to help you? Um, Maybe some of the mindset things that's been 
uh, keeping you back. You need to better understand some of the rules governing debt or the third one, which is what a lot of the real estate investors talk about, which is leverage, right? How do we leverage debt to get us there? This is the podcast you want to listen to. Let's jump in right now. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now, here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. So debt is an issue, Joey. Uh, we've heard it so many times. I don't know, probably maybe one of the most common topics that is asked of us, like how how did you get over not needing to pay off your house? How did you get over, you know, borrowing money in order to invest into fill in the blank project? Talk to me a little bit about the mindset that needs to happen in order for us to really better understand that, also the mindset that's preventing us from being able to pursue financial freedom at the pace we need. Man, I'll tell you something that I actually shared on a, a, a guest podcast I was on today was, man, who are you taking advice from? And are you just in the default mode of accepting the advice from all the people that you're the closest to? Because if you, if you really do that, and that's your only means of making a financial decision is based on that, then you have to actually zoom out a second and say, are these the people that have done or are on the path of the place that I want to be? And if they're not, then aren't you just continuing a bad formula, right? Like if someone is 10 steps further than you, in a direction, and that direction is not leading them to where you want to be, then you are inherently saying, I'm going down the wrong path and I'm going to just keep following blindly. The reason I mention that is so many people, um, like they, they like to think that we were like against Dave Ramsey. I'm not against Dave Ramsey. I just know that Dave Ramsey continuously teaches a scarcity mindset around this specific topic of debt. And we've actually shared this in our Inner Circle Live. You, you have guys like Robert Kiyosaki who says, be debt free. And he's like, that's an idiot. You're like, you're an idiot if you think that debt freedom is going to get you to where you want to be. He says, I'm a billion dollars in debt. And it's because he understands what financial freedom takes is to leverage that debt into your actual end result. And so to me is who is that person that is shaping your mindset? And you're the one that's in control of that. If you have the wrong people around you, get the right people around you. And that's part of the reason why we have this community, right? And if you're not a part of one of our masterminds, you have an opportunity. So um, your mindset is, is really your problem and you have to solve it with the people around you. Well, I want to touch on it really quickly and I'll come to you, Mark, because I know that you want to touch on whether or not debt freedom really is financial freedom. But the thing I, I think about is what is scarcity versus abundance? I don't know if that, that's a, a common term, I think, in our world, right? That's a common term in our community because we are always talking about an abundant mindset. But I don't think, I didn't understand what a scarcity and abundance was until I got into this world. It's possible as you're listening to this right now, the road or running on the treadmill, that maybe you really don't have a great understanding of what scarcity and abundance looks like. Here's a, here's a basic definition I'll give you. Scarcity means there's a finite amount of goods or resources to make something happen, right? No matter what it is, I don't know how I'm going to do that because I don't possess whatever's needed to make it happen. As compared to the opposite, the abundant mindset says, maybe I don't know how, but I'm going to look for the opportunities, right? I'm going to seek the who's out there in the world who can help me learn the how. 
and that there's not just one way, right? There's not just one pie out there and it's all divided it out and maybe I don't get my share. No, there's an opportunity to create new pies. Heck, there's an opportunity to create a pie company. And I want to figure out how do I get plugged into that and get in the way of that. What, what kind of pies are we talking about? Just so I'm clear, Russ. I'm, it's it, that time in the afternoon. I'm just, be honest, I'm getting a little hungry. It, it, any kind of pie, man. Any pie is good. Mark, does debt freedom equal financial freedom? In my estimate, no. However, financial freedom could lead you to debt freedom if that's where you wanted to go. What do you really want? Do you do you want to be debt free? Oh, oh, okay, great. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're financially free. However, if you achieve financial freedom, you now have passive income exceeding your monthly expenses. So you could then, in theory, have excess, and then you could potentially then become debt free if you wanted to as well. I like to, the thing that popped into my head for, for debt is you think about back in the day, fire, right? I mean, it's summertime. We've got wildfires. There's been a horrible tragedy on the island of Maui where fire was an incredibly destructive force. And so for a lot of people, they fear fire and, and they, they say, you know what? Don't want any part of it. Don't want to be around it. However, fire can also be a force for good, right? Think of a forest fire. A lot of people would initially think, oh my gosh, that's tragedy. Look at the forest, it burned. But that's the natural system of nature to go through and burn things out. And then there's regrowth and there's all this great stuff that comes out of it in the aftermath. So my point there is it can be used as a tool, but you have to be respectful of it. Fire is dangerous and debt is dangerous too if you don't know what you're doing, if you're not using the proper precautions. So this isn't a discussion about license to go out and just go hog wild on getting debt. You you got to know what you're dealing with and you have to be responsible with it. Great. I, I, but that's a, a mindset that we have. Like if you say, oh, well, I ha own this business. And if I sold this business and I got, you know, X million dollars and I have Y million dollars in debt, wouldn't it feel nice to just take all that money and pay off the debt? Like then you think of all the monthly payments and, that exist associated with those debts. You're like, I would be free, right? Like I, I wouldn't have those payments. It, that would be like a big, huge weight off of me. Ernie, tell me why that's not just the only thing I need to be considered. The thing that comes to my mind dealing with the, the mindset and approach to debt is it's not about the, uh, the Jimmy's and the Joe's. It's not, it's not the numbers, but zoom back out and, and think about the emotion of money, specifically the emotion of debt. And we, we know this, do I make good decisions when I'm afraid? Do you make good decisions when you're afraid? And I remember a lot of years ago with some of my friends just sort of confessing like, Hey, <laughs> as a guy, I basically think I experienced two emotions, happiness and anger. At least that's what I'm uh, emotionally mature enough to recognize, but that's not the case. There's a, there's a lot more going on there. So when we're dealing with debt, wouldn't it be a shame to think about how many people won't get to financial freedom because they're afraid of debt or larger than that, they're afraid of money or how many people will focus their energy on getting out of debt? Russ, what you mentioned, if I get out of debt, I won't have that monthly payment anymore. But I think larger than that, so many people want to get out of debt because then they won't have to be afraid of it anymore. And what negative impacts, how much time lost doing that quote unquote busy work, what are they giving up by making decisions out of fear and, and not recognizing Maybe I am afraid of debt and just thinking through that and, and working on yourself in that way to say objectively, this isn't good or bad, but how am I going to approach this and then apply the Jimmy's and the Joe's into that situation? I think that that'd be where I would think mindset is so important. So we've, we've hit mindset. I want to jump into the rules of debt. As we jump into that, I, I do think we need to be mindful as we go into what I believe is, and what I believe is just reading what others are believing and, and just agreeing, is that we are already in a recession well on our way toward maybe something even bigger, right? There's a lot of bad news that is out there. And 
the news is the news, but I think it's bad for those who are not adequately positioned. And for some people, it's because they are under debt, right? Their debt is going to be variable rate. And whether that's lines of credit, that is, uh, you know, business debt that they have that's having to be renewed on a regular basis. And now those interest rates are causing pain points in their business. Maybe some of those lines of credit that they have is going to or already are being crunched and reduced, which will create issues, right? We need to understand the rules of debt. There's lots of different rules out there. Mark, let's talk about one of the rules that you uh, ha have come up with that might help somebody. Oh, yeah. I got smoked on this one. The uh, very first piece of property I ever bought, I thought I was going to do the right thing, right? I'm getting ready to purchase a home. I'm going to go into a tremendous amount of debt. So what should I do? I should cut up the things that could potentially look bad on my my overall credit history, I should I should remove exposure. So I went and canceled a credit card. Of course, it was the oldest credit card I had. And the rules of debt say, wait a minute, we, we, we just lost a bunch of your credit history. So we now have to penalize you for that. And I had to sit there and, and look at my good family friend who was the, the mortgage broker. And I said, wait, so I did the right thing. I was responsible. I removed a potential credit burden. He said, yep. But now you're being punished for making a consciously wise decision, but not a bank debt rule good decision. And um, this actually just brought up in my mind, I, I was at Costco yesterday and there was a gentleman signing up for Costco and, and the, the lady helping him set up his membership says, now, by the way, would you like to apply for the Costco credit card? You get all these benefits, you know, 3% gas, 2%. And the guy emphatically said, nope, mm -mm, nope. Don't want it. Don't touch them. Allergic to them. Get them away from me. Never want credit cards. Only going to use cash. And I had to stop and I thought about him like, he doesn't know how to properly use debt. A credit card is a floating form of debt. He's going to pay cash anyway. He's going to settle his debt anyway. Wouldn't you rather float that for 30 days and get some benefits from it? So use the rules to your advantage. They're there. And I, I, I just had to giggle about that. And I looked at Sharon because we were standing in line. I just, I rolled my eyes and kept my mouth shut until we walked away. And I went, oh my gosh, what a bummer. That guy left food on the table. Well, you know, one of the things you mentioned is that when you got rid of that credit card, not only did you get rid of like one of your longest credit lines, your history, right? This is the thing that tells the word, world how good or bad you are at paying debt down, right? Like that's why they would extend credit to you, but also you reduce the limit of debt that you had, right? So if you had a hundred thousand dollars of lines of credit and you had $20,000, you know, borrowed out there, you had a 20% debt ratio, right? To your line of credit. Well, if you get rid of a $20,000 credit card line, then what did you do? You just, you're 20,000. Now you have 20,000 against 80 thousand dollars so you just increased the percentage of debt that you have available which also is a negative to the amount of uh, your credit score which impacts what we can borrow at and we have to know those rules because borrowing money has implication on our ability to advance Aaron, what's another rule of debt we need to understand yeah i'm going to lean on the on the positive side a uh, rule of debt to help and, and that's this, debt doesn't make a bad thing better, but debt can make a good thing better. So how do you do that? Well, I think number one, debt, that's really just about how we purchase things. So the thing, the thing we buy, if it's a bad asset, <laughs> debt's not going to make the bad asset a good asset, right? But debt, debt can accelerate our ability to create more good assets. So how do we protect ourselves? And you already mentioned this, so I'll keep it brief. When when dealing in debt, you you need to know the terms. You need to think through and understand all variables of the debt. Uh, we know with with certain lines of credit, we've seen them be the those lines frozen. We've seen them called. We know uh, this is, I don't think this is news to anyone, but as interest rates have risen, variable loan rates 
that that's been negatively impactful for many people. And, and I know a lot of people are experiencing that right now, but knowing those terms and the variables of the debt on the front end will help you when you find a good thing, determine if I'm going to use debt on this, how can I make this good thing even better? And what that will do is it'll help you be safe with debt and it will help you to win more regularly. Joey, we were together and we were talking about different lines of credit, just what Ernie was alluding to. And one of the lines of credit I have has increased to nine and a half percent. And I was like, man, that's expensive. You know, given that, I mean, was it 12, 18 months ago, it was like, 3%, right? So yeah, like just the cost on that line has significantly increased, like tripled, right? In the interest rate. And we were having a conversation around that and talking about, well, what's the best use? Should we, should we allocate other funds that are in other places that maybe either at lower borrowing cost and eliminate that debt? And what did you tell me? Like, what did you tell me re regards to if I went and eliminated that debt, that interest rate, how might that play out? What what was the benefit of me keeping it and what would be the potentially the cost of me getting rid of it? You remember? Uh, you know, Russ, I only listen to a very small percentage of what you say. Um, and so this would be one of those, I don't, re I don't recall exactly what you're talking about. Well, you said th what you're paying is the right to have access to the money. <laughs> that is true, yes. And you're taking my, my whole point from our leverage conversation. Do you want me to get into that now or do you want me to well, get into yeah, that? I mean, if you, if you don't have another rule, I mean, to me, that's. To oh, me, I got rules. Is, you just need real. This, this is a rule here to me because I think you got to understand the rules that you're playing with. Because if you start, if you have a lot of credit today and you eliminate that, the debt, the balance on that line as a former banker, what have you seen happen? They will cut that thing off as fast as they possibly can. If you're not utilizing it, they will, they will stop it. They will limit your access to it in a heartbeat because they're trying to take any and all precautions against future risk, especially when it's tied to an asset like a house that will potentially be losing value. It happens all the time. And most people have never experienced this. So they just assume, well, I have this line of credit. It's available to me until it's not. Because they don't make the rules. Who makes the rules? The bank. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the Passive Income Operating System, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income it makes all the steps come together if you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener we've never given this away in public before go to what's what wall street.com forward slash p-i-o-s there was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying pop quiz day why because you were unprepared are you unprepared though for financial freedom don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30 second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. I think that that's a, an important part I was just trying to make there as far as rules is that you need to understand that even in some regards, right? Like our, there are debt sometimes that we will carry the debt because it continues to give us access to the money, right? Like I can get rid of that, that higher interest rate debt with something else. And if I looked at it on a black and white sheet of paper, and that's all I applied, does it make more sense, Ernie, to borrow money at 5.5% than at 9.5%? A Georgia grad, uh, you know, a Georgia but yes. Barry grad could tell you that that's a good idea. Well, but also at the same time, if, if you then lose, if they do shut down that line and you then lose access to that ability to have that money, what could that money been able to do, right? Because if I could outperform the nine and a half percent debt, which if I'm not, you know, good good enough to do that, while I'm on this podcast talking to you, then I, I need to re reconsider options. True, 
Now, Joey, do you have any other rules or you want to jump into leverage now? Oh my goodness. Russ, if I skip this, I'm going to be just mad the rest of the day. I, I had this, this is, let's get real talk here. Okay. The rules of debt, as you, as you say, if you're going to play the game of debt, you got to be a banker. I'm going to go Nelson Nash on you. Okay. And this is, this just happened yesterday. I was talking to a gentleman. He's been practicing infinite banking for a while. He's got a policy and he's got some loans outstanding against his policy. And he's real nervous. And he's telling me, he's like, man, I'm actually considering shutting down this policy so I can pay off the loans on another policy, use that cash value to pay off the other policy. And then I can just start a new one fresh. And, and this is real. This is real because people see the interest that they're paying on a loan in a policy. And they see it as this is an expense. Now, there's a, a lot of observations around this. I'm going to try to keep it super brief. Number one, the reason why your policy is a benefit and it shows you the cost of borrowing, that is a benefit to you because any bank looks at what it costs them to borrow and it's how much they're paying depositors. Okay, so think about that for a second. A bank looks at depositors' money as a liability. They have to pay for the use of that money. As a somebody who's practicing with banking, you borrow money from your policy or against your policy, I should say, you now have a physical cost associated with that. That helps you to become the best investor you can be. Because as soon as you can count the cost, you can say, was the thing I went to go put it to work for worth it? And in his case, this was this super interesting to me. In his case, he had told me he took a $100,000 loan several years ago and had invested it wisely in a real estate sort of business type dealing. And that investment paid back $500,000 three years later. And here's the same guy. So he had used that money to go do this investment. Just think about a bank. He took depositors money. He went over here and he made $400,000 on that money, right? And he was worried about the $7,000 in interest that he had paid to get it. And I told him, I said, wait a minute, zoom out. And I want you to just think of the whole formula. All you're looking at is what was the dividend paid and what was the interest paid. And the truth of the matter is the rules of debt say every time my capital costs me money, it's what am I going to do with it? And how does that play into the overall ROI? right? In his case, it was through the roof. And he was like, wow, I didn't think about that. I was so zoomed in on the things that don't matter. I missed the big picture of what I was actually able to use it for. So the rule of debt in my mind is be the bank. Think like the bank. And if you don't know how to do that, you got to get around the people that do, right? You have to educate yourself. That's why I'm saying, don't be like Robert Kiyosaki. He says, I'm a billion dollars of debt. The guy is super skilled investor and he's taught himself to think like a bank. You just can't do that overnight. So anyway, those are, I got way more observations, but I'm just going to stop it right there. If you need answers to those questions, you got those same questions. You go to wealthwellwallstreet.com forward slash free call. And one of these coaches will be glad to answer them. If you heard Joey say the word policy or life insurance, and you're like, I don't understand how you would ever get money out of a life insurance policy. I'm on life insurance. I've never gotten money out of it. I don't even understand how that's possible. On that call, they can talk through that to you because these insurance policies have what's called a cash value. That cash value is equivalent to equity in a house. I think it's a really good analogy as we talk about that because we start thinking about the rules of debt governing a house, right? We have equity in a house and we have a mortgage against the house, right? The debt against the house. And we, we know, well, if I want to get access to the equity in the house, I have to go to the bank and borrow money. But we also know when we take a loan from the bank, Joey, there's a bunch of paperwork that's required. There's a, actually, there's a list of things you have to give them in addition to all your signatures, which is 
Um, here's what my last two years worth of income were. I, I can prove to you that I still have a job or I have the ability to produce income in the future. Here's what my credit score is. All of those things, right? That's the rules governing traditional loans. When we say the word loan as it relates to an insurance company, when we're borrowing money against our cash value, the equity in our life insurance contract, we don't have those, do we? We don't have to provide any proof of uh, current income, future income, past income, no credit score, none of that is required. That's why these instruments become very valuable to us. But what can you borrow? You can only borrow against what's in the contract, what the cash value is. So if you've been one of those like, I don't know how to borrow money against a life insurance policy, the probably number one answer is you don't have cash value. You've, you've been purchasing life insurance for the purpose of a death benefit. Well, when you borrow money against a life insurance policy, you're actually getting a prepayment of your death benefit. Now, who doesn't like that, Earn? Who wouldn't want to have the ability to borrow money against and get our death benefit today while we're still living? I think there is a big key as we get into rules of debt as it revolves around borrowing money against a life insurance contract. Our third point, though, as we start to bring this down, we've covered the mindset, we cover rules of debt, leverage, right? I think this is where most of the real estate investors, most of the people who've been borrowing money for the purpose of acquiring assets have gone, but it, maybe this will be one that you have it and need a, you know, a little more of a uh, education on. Ernie, talk to me a little bit about leverage. Yeah, well, I just give you just a very simple example. You talk about real estate investors. Let's say that you've got you know, $500,000. Would you rather buy one investment property with $500,000 or put 50,000 down on 10 investment properties. Well, I, I, if you were wise, you say I need more information, <laughs> right? But let's say that if you buy that one property, it cash flows to you $5,000 a month. But if you buy those 10 properties, it would cash flow to you $6,000 a month. Well, the Jimmy's and the Joe's would say, well, it's better to have multiple properties. But if you can evaluate your mindset around debt and say, okay, I see maybe some potential financial benefits of leverage, then uh, what other benefits would there be in addition to that? And here would be some thoughts. Is there any benefit to having multiple properties as compared to just one? To having multiple leases, multiple tenants? So that if one moves out, you still have a rental income compared to if you have one property, you have only one income. We mentioned the higher cash flow that you can achieve from having multiple properties using leverage. In addition to that, the IRS allows us to write off the interest expense on that debt. And if we have multiple properties and one or two or three of them turn out to be undesirable properties, you can sell them but still have a portfolio. But if you put all your cash into one deal and it's a bad deal, you don't want to keep it, you sell it, now you have no deals. So if you can get past the emotion of money, uh, you can take advantage of some of the financial benefits of leverage and also accomplish many other benefits. Love that. Mark, give me some more insights around leverage. Well, since I got smoked on a real estate deal earlier, I'll, I'll, I'll put that fire out and share this one with you. So another piece of property. And just for argument's sake, let's say that I have a $2,200 mortgage every single month. So hypothetically month, speaking? Hypothetically speaking. Okay. So every month I'm pulling 2,200 bucks out of my pocket and paying for this house, right? Because it's, it's a primary residence. It's not an asset. It's a liability. We can talk about that on another show. But what if circumstances change and now the, the value of my home has increased? And what if I can do a cash out refi and take out a chunk of cash? With that new liquidated cash, I can go and invest into a cash flowing asset, something that generates money back to me. And now let's say my mortgage went from $2,600. Let's say that it increased with that cash out refi to two thousand. sorry, $2,200. It's now increased to two thousand six hundred. Well, that's a four hundred dollar. It's a four hundred dollar increase, which I mean, my gosh, that sounds horrible, right? End of the world, poor choice, um, failure on Mark. 
However, what if the asset that I invested into produced $2,200 of cash every single month? So now you take that $2,600 mortgage, you take the $2,200 that's coming in from the investment. My out-of-pocket now for the new scenario is $400. So I went from $2,200 out of pocket to $400 out of pocket because I went, quote, further into debt. So the question becomes, Mark, did that action of borrowing more money create a you to get closer to or further from financial freedom? Uh, the answer is what is closer, Joey? 100%. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you you had an ex existing liability of 2200 and now that liability is down to 400 If passive income greater than monthly expenses is our ultimate objective, you actually got way closer in that one fell swoop move. And that's the difference of so looking at leverage instead of this is debt. Debt is all debt is bad. If it actually helps you get to closer to financial freedom, it is so worth it. Russ, what about you? You have to have a story about leverage or something that you can add value to this conversation concerning leverage. As if I'm not adding value is what you said. I'm, I, hey, you know, take it for what it's worth. Challenge accepted. Here, here's yesterday we had a conversation within our passive income mastermind. And it really, it started out with you and I looking at how we could acquire profitable things, right? We were talking about how do we acquire existing life insurance policies? Like, how do we buy profitable life insurance policies? Meaning people who own life insurance policies who no longer want them, acquire them and getting the benefits of them having gone through the first couple of years, right? But then we started applying that same concept to how do we acquire other profitable things? And the conversation quickly morphed in our mastermind to, wow, I need to figure out how to accelerate my status of a solo entrepreneur, S quadrant business owner to a B, big B business owner. And it is really like, how do I take my active business and start making it more passive? Well, when I think of leverage and I think about where people have gotten to the highest level in business is that they have decided where do I need to apply the right amount of money and the right amount of people and the right amount of tools and resources to get myself from S to B as fast as possible. And, and I was talking to a, a couple of business owners who, who actually coach other entrepreneurs on how to uh, build businesses in the digital world. And we were, we were, we were discussing one member that we have in our passive income mastermind who has been fabulously successful and has created an amazing business, a, an eight figure income business in a matter of a couple of years. And I was like, what do you think the major difference was that this business owner, this entrepreneur had that others who have good ideas, good products, good abilities, why is it that he's had that, that extra success and they have it? And one of the insights they gave me is that he was willing to leverage dollars in areas where other people were. He was willing to take the quote unquote risk to accelerate the process. And I think uh, whenever we're talking about leverage, right? It's, it's, it's getting that, that tool and getting, and Mark, you, you've said this way better than I will, right? It's, it, we all have that, the potential of having the lever, but it's getting it in, in the position at the right place, right? To have the ultimate impact. Well, some people are just not willing to push down on that lever in certain areas. Some are. And the ones who, if you're listening to this, you're a business owner and you're like, man, I need to get out of the grind. I've got to quit spending 60, 80, 100 hours a week because I'm giving up access to my family. I'm giving up summers that I don't have that many left with, with my kids before they're gone. I'm giving up the best times of my life that I could be utilizing and doing other things and having a higher impact. Well, leverage provides that opportunity, right? Now you have to understand how to use it correctly, as you said before, Mark. But when we have that lever, we know where to put it at the right place. We can actually get the best result out of it. How about that, Sally? What's your thoughts? I mean, how do you like them apples? 
it's, it's all I, I mean, I appreciate, I appreciate the passion and, uh, yeah, th that was amazing. Oh, to, to wrap this up today, we've talked about your mindset around debt. We've talked about the rules of debt and we've talked about leverage and how to make leverage your friend in your own path to financial freedom. Before we wrap up, I want everybody to kind of do a quick uh, final thoughts. And Ernie, I'll start with you. Mark will come to you next. Yep. Final thought. We we want to accelerate, right? And Mark, I uh, appreciate your fire analogy uh, because if you um, spray certain chemicals onto a fire, you can accelerate that flame, right? And uh, now we want to do that in a controlled manner, right? We can, we can burn down the house, potentially the neighborhood. We're not, not careful. But the whole goal is how can we be accelerating to financial freedom? Debt is just one of those ways, right? Solving the money problem. And uh, we, we have to be open to using it. If we say, I'll never do that, then we are living in a scarce world. And I'm afraid that uh, we will not get there or we'll get there well behind the schedule and we will have missed the, the precious time and we would have greatly enjoyed doing other things with the people that we loved. That's why that's so important. Mark, same question. Final thoughts. When you know what's going on, you'll know what to do. When you understand the landscape and you understand the rules, you understand the dangers. I mean, you know, Peter Parker's uncle said it best, right? Which is with great power comes great responsibility. Debt is not something to be taken lightly. Like Ernie's to Ernie's point, it can definitely accelerate you, but it can also accelerate you potentially in the wrong direction if you use it the wrong way. But if you get around people that are using it the right way, maybe get some coaching on ideas and tips and and tricks of how to use it, how to how to be a good steward of it. Then let's see how much faster we can get you where you want to go. I love it. My my final thoughts would be. Take action in the way in which it's uncomfortable. Like right now, as you, we've been talking about debt. If there's something that we've said that just makes you say, "Ooh, I don't, I don't know about that whole borrowing against my house." I've always been told you should be supposed to pay that off as fast as possible. Or, man, the idea of putting less of a down payment on an on a investment property. I just want to pay cash. If any of those things have been uncomfortable, walk in the way of educating yourself towards that and don't just assume the default way that you've always thought about this is the best way. Because when you actually stop and slow down and you start to invest in that, you may be surprised at how quickly you can, uh, I'm going to keep using the word accelerate, you can accelerate your path to financial freedom and don't miss out on actually starting that process with one of our coaches, right? They're here to help walk you through this path and to make you see things you never saw that were possible. Go to wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash free call and jump on a call with them today. Wise guy that I met one time quoted this. I don't know if it was his or something he had read. It says, what you fear, you face constantly. And if if you fear debt, then uh, you're going to probably face it in many different ways. But if you're focused on building your financial IQ, increasing your passive income to exceed your monthly expenses, then you will face that opportunity and you'll have that opportunity to be able to grow, right? What we track grows, what we track and report on grows exponentially. I'll leave you with being able to think about how do you do, um, impact both sides of that line and are the things you do in getting you closer to or further from financial freedom. If you haven't had a chance already, please take time to rate and review the show, share it with somebody, at the, someone you know that really needs to hear this episode because they've been held back by just the thought or the concern or the fear around debt. We'd love for you to be sharing this with them so they can have more insights to becoming financially free, just like you're on the path as well. Have an amazing day. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms.
in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.